OK, I think we'll start. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to my talk. My name is Hagai Atias. I'm a senior software architect at Akamai. I'll be talking about interactive analytics at scale. Uh, this is a project we were working closely with Databricks over the last year or so when we were started to move our analytics products from the on-prem over to the cloud on Azure. So a little bit about, about me. Like I said, I'm a senior software architect at Akamai. I've been working with big data since 2014, uh, mainly on Apache Spark and also some Hadoop MapReduce in the early days. And I've been using Databricks since uh, 2020. If you want to connect with me, feel free to reach out. Love to talk to you. Uh, so about Akamai, um, I guess most of you are aware uh, Akamai is a CDN company. We uh, provide uh, CDN services and cloud security services to our customers. Um, numbers talk about something like 30% of internet's traffic go through the Akamai network. And you know, whenever you're browsing the web, you're probably, probably hitting um, one or more Akamai server, uh, no matter where you go. We have around 350K uh, edge servers that are distributed globally and are responsible to uh, distribute all this traffic. And we collect a lot of security events that we get to our system. Uh, and we use this data to provide analytics and build security products and protect our customers. And generally, we make the internet fast, reliable, and secure. So uh, let me tell you about the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, we need to provide our customers with real-time interactive analytics so they are able to run queries against their data and get results in, in real time. Uh, so just to give you some numbers, for this type of product that we're working on, we get about 1.5 gigabytes a second of data. This is compressed. Uh, about 6 million records a second of malicious activity. And over the course of 30 days, over the course of 30 days, that totals to something like uh, four petabytes uh, that we provide interactive analytics over. And like I said, Akamai is a, you know, a large enterprise. We serve some of the biggest enterprises out there. So think of you know, names like TikTok or Airbnb, Amazon, uh, Nike, Adidas, and many other big uh, retailers and, and media companies that are coming to Akamai uh, to get services, and they, uh, we need to provide analytics for uh, also those uh, very huge customers. So um, here's a simplified architecture of what we have. So on the left, this is the Akamai Edge network, sending events to uh, our, uh, I call it the receiving layer that we have deployed on, on Azure. From there, um, we use Kafka and ADLS to stream those events. And then we use Azure Databricks uh, to process it and write it to uh, Delta. OK? Uh, and the, what we don't see in this picture is the receiving side. But imagine a customer that comes to us, and uh, it goes to the Akamai portal, which is, by the way, also deployed on Azure. And then using JDBC, we query uh, Delta Lake to, um, to consume the data. Now, what you don't see in, in this diagram is um, what is called the medallion architecture. So in this type of workload, we are not fully deploying the medallion architecture. Uh, we, have, we are doing some cleanups and some transformations in the receiving layer. And then we also definitely doing some transformations on Azure Databricks when we uh, create a Delta table. Uh, but that's it. You won't find any, uh, any gold layer here uh, and no aggregations at all. And to uh, understand why, let's see, let's talk about some of the challenges that we have. So we have very strict KPIs that we need to, um, you need to uh, meet uh, for this type of products, and these are uh, regarding data availability and query performance. So events needs to be available for consumption 
uh, within just five minutes of occurring at the Akamai edge, which, we, which leaves very little time for ingestion. And then those events cannot be pre-aggregated, like I said, um, mainly because of two reasons. One, we need to support over 60 different filter combinations. So no matter what you choose to aggregate on, a customer wants to apply a filter and you don't have a pre-aggregation on, on this set of filters. And obviously you cannot pre-aggregate on, uh, on everything. And the second thing is, like I said, we do need to meet a very strict SLA for data availability and pre-aggregation adds latency. Uh, the next KPI, uh, which is kind of tough, is we need to return our queries within 10 seconds for the 99 percentile. Now, like I said, we do have some very large customers and queries can scan hundreds of terabytes uh, of data. Uh, well, you still need to meet this, uh, this um, KPI. And the last thing that makes it, makes it a challenge is that we don't only provide high-level analytics, we also support uh, a drill down to see the actual raw data up to the event level, okay? So let's talk about ingestion. And I'm gonna start uh, slow by talking about uh, optimized writes. Uh, so optimized writes is a feature that exists in, in DBR. I'm not going to fully explain what it does because it's a fairly well-documented feature. But just to, uh, just to give an idea, uh, so instead of having your data being written directly from the executors, what optimized writes will do, it will add an extra shuffle phase that corresponds to your table partitioning scheme so you get to write less files per each partition, and in most cases, just one file per partition. So eventually, on ingest time, you end up with less files. Now, what we thought is that uh, this, is, you know, this is great, but it's gonna add some latency uh, to our ingest job. But what we found out is that optimized writes on our scale and our workload actually speeds up ingestion. And the reason is that if you have a la uh, large enough cluster and a strong enough VM with enough memory, those, the extra shuffle phase is probably not going to do any spill. And then it's gonna finish fast enough and then you get the benefit of just writing much, much less files, uh, which is obviously way faster than writing a lot of files. So this is a comparison that we did between a traditional write and optimized writes where we clearly see uh, that optimized writes is faster for ingestion. And this is, you know, this is just on our workload, uh, but it helped a lot. So we, we, get, uh, we get two things at once. We get faster micro batches, which is great, because we do need to meet the uh, five minutes SLA, but we also end, end up with much less files on the storage, which definitely speeds up uh, consumption. So more on ingestion. And this is somewhat involved, so um, try to bear with me. Um, this is how our micro batches used to look like uh, when we started. So you see And then it writes it out to the table, which is great. And in an optimized world, this is where you would expect that your micro batch will end, right? Um, but what actually happens is that those metadata jobs start to kick in. So this is a state reconstruction uh, that has to read the entire uh, previous commits of the table in order to uh, append the new commit. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And this is a post commit state re reconstruction that also happens inside the micro batch, this is mainly for uh, computing the checksum and making sure that uh, there's, there, there were no errors uh, as the result of the new commit. So as you can see, this adds some latency and also takes a fair amount of resources from the cluster. Then, uh, then we have some uh, sampling job. So this is doing uh, sampling uh, in order to get the boundaries, in order to uh, reorder the commits 
and, and, and the checkpoint. So I'm not going to talk about how checkpointing works in Delta, but imagine that whenever you have to ch do a checkpoint, this definitely adds some latency. So, uh, and if you exceed, I think, 10 MB of total commits, uh, which is the default in Delta, that means you're going to do a checkpoint on every uh, micro batch, uh, which is what happened to us. So um, after the sampling phase, there's a shuffling and eventually, finally, there's a, a new checkpoint that's being created. So this is the checkpoint and, and then finally we have the new micro batch that starts and it's, it does start in parallel, meaning that except for the two state reconstruction jobs, it does not wait for the writing of the new checkpoint. So you gotta get a speed up there, but those uh, checkpointing uh, jobs definitely takes resources from the cluster. And uh, what I also wanted to mention is that you don't really have to you know, understand each of, uh, each of these steps because uh, it can get a little bit overwhelming at the beginning, but what's important to understand is that you have to keep an eye on those metadata operation if you have a table like we do, uh, which has a lot of files and a lot of partitions, and obviously, as a result of that, a lot of metadata. So what you can see here is that roughly 55% of the overall batch resources are used for metadata handling, which is a lot. You can also see that it took, uh, the last job took 59 seconds to complete, so you get some uh, extra latency there in your micro batch. So, um, luckily we can do a lot better. So the first thing uh, that we did after consulting with Databricks is that we bump the threshold of when Delta is going to decide to uh, make a checkpoint. So like I said, the default is 10 MB. Uh, we've bumped it to uh, 100 MB. Uh, and that means that for us, on average, we are only going to create a checkpoint on every three micro batches. So that says about 33% of, of uh, the resources used for the micro batch. Uh, which is great, and obviously this results in much faster uh, batches. I think I have a graph that shows it. What you have to remember is that checkpointing is there to speed up readers, right? Because the idea is when you checkpoint, there's only one file that a reader needs to read in order to um, understand what is the state of the table. Uh, so if you do something like this, remember that your readers could potentially be affected because now they have to read not just one checkpoint, but a checkpoint plus a few last quotes. Uh, but from what we've seen, this really doesn't have any effect on readers uh, because mainly two reasons. A, you know, we can still read a bunch of files uh, when you come to read uh, and it's still going to be fast enough. And the second thing is that uh, metadata is cached on, on Delta. So whenever there's a new snapshot, it's only going to read it once and cache it. It uses a uh, Spark cache, Spark RDB cache. And then every other uh, reader, every other read is not really going to go to the storage, just going to take it from the cache. Uh, so this is great. But obviously we wanted to do better. So um, together with Databricks, uh, you know, the team, uh, Databricks, they came up with what's called incremental commits. And this is uh, coming up in, in um, DBR 11.1. The idea is that we can definitely eliminate those two state reconstruction jobs that were happening by just looking at the partial commit without, sorry, but just looking at the new commit that needs to happen without reading every uh, commit that happened before, without actually reading the entire state of the table. Uh, and that eliminates state reconstruction, uh, and if you're gonna use it, make sure uh, that you set it manually on 11.1 on because it's still in validation mode. But for us, it's going to be a game changer. Uh, eliminate, uh, preliminary testing shows something like 50% uh, of, of speed up in our micro batches, micro batches which, is, uh, which is great. And the next thing that is going to come up um, um, later this year is incremental checkpoints. So checkpoints are still going to happen even with incremental commits. 
uh, and these are, these are uh, delta log checkpoints. Uh, they're still going to happen, but uh, incremental uh, checkpoint is kind of similar to incremental commits. It's just going to, to make sure that uh, checkpoints are um, running way faster and, and definitely speeds it up. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk about compaction. Uh, the only thing I have to say here is that you should consider if you really need the order. Um, so what happened to us, we are compacting the same partition more than once, either because we want to account for late deliveries or we have, let's say we have a daily partition that we have to optimize every hour. So with the order or without the order, this is a pretty simple operation. It's gonna take some you know, big files and make a bigger uh, files out of them uh, in a recompaction kind of way. But if you add a Z order to it, so every operation is going to have to recompute the Z cubes. Uh, and that's, that does not necessarily an incremental operation. I took this from um, the Databricks uh, documentation where it clearly says that the time it takes to Z order is not guaranteed to reduce sort of multiple runs. Now, like I said, we do have over 60 different filter combinations. Uh, without any clear dominance to them, so, to them. So, so uh, for us, there no, there's really no, uh, no reason to Z order. And by removing Z order, we were able to uh, run our optimized jobs much faster with way less resources. Last thing I have to say is that if you're running Z order on something that is time-based, like a timestamp or, or something like that, remember that um, you probably have uh, a min and max values in delta that are probably pretty much uh, in a good state uh, because time is naturally ever increasing, right? So your min and max values are, you know, are pretty much uh, distinct. So you need to cons really consider if you need Z order, if you are uh, doing Z order or not, something that is a timestamp. Okay, um, let's talk about caching. So caching is going to happen automatically in Delta. I'm sure you're all aware if your VM supports it, meaning that it has um, you know, an SSD or an NVMe attached to it. But what we are doing is we kind of take it to the next step and we run, uh, we run cache select uh, to prefetch data uh, before it's even needed. And the reason we do that is sometimes we have queries uh, coming from customers that are so big that going to the actual storage and re reading it is still slow enough, and I'll show you uh, how slow in, in a second. And you know, this has a lot to do with, with bandwidth limits that we're hitting uh, on the storage, so we're hitting more than, um, I think on Azure the default is 50 gigabits per second uh, of egress and ingress. Uh, so uh, if a large query come in, comes in, you don't wanna wait uh, all this uh, throttling that is happening, you better uh, bring it from the local storage. So this proves to be very useful uh, to improve the fast query performance. As you can see on the, on the right side, this is without pre-caching, and I think this is on one of our largest customers. Um, the first query took over, I think it's 150 seconds, uh, and then obviously the ones that came after were uh, way faster, comparing to when we uh, run cache select, uh, then we get a pretty decent uh, performance. Now what we don't wanna happen is we don't want a customer to come in, use the application, and then you know, wait 150 seconds to get a result. No, no one is gonna wait that long. Remember, this is an interactive use case. They're gonna probably uh, you know, close it and, and never come back. So we wanna make sure we, give a, we um, give a pretty consistent experience to our users by doing that, uh, by doing a cache select, what we call a prefetch. Uh, now, you, if you wanna do something like this, remember that um, prefetching does take resources from the cluster. So you have to, uh, you have to do it wisely. We call it, call it a managed cache select, where we choose exactly which columns we wanna bring. These are the, probably the most uh, common, commonly used columns that, that are interesting, and also we only bring it for a selected set of customers, which we know are problematic because they have a lot of data. 
And the idea is that even if you get throttled when you run a cache select, this is where you kind of want to take the hit. You want to take the hit when you uh, run the cache select, and it's okay if you get throttled, but then when a query comes in, a customer query comes in, it's going to read it from the local cache and get uh, great performance. Uh, so this is a, a comparison that we did between um, running a large cache select and a managed cache select. Uh, so you can see that a managed cache select in red is, is uh, uh, the way to go uh, because it does not affect other running queries on the cluster. It doesn't take all the resources from the cluster. Uh, so if you want to do it, remember to, to, to do it wisely. Uh, this is pretty obvious on caching, uh, but uh, the less VMs that you have, uh, meaning that the less disk that you have, meaning that uh, the higher the cache hit ratio is going to be. Um, so this is a comparison we did between two uh, different cluster uh, setups with the exact same compute power. And you see that uh, cache misses are happening on the right just because there are 160 nodes. Um, so the likelihood of, of hitting, oh, of uh, having a cache miss is, is higher than just having uh, 40 disks or 40 nodes. Um, and the last thing on, on caching is that using this code, you can, at the query level, inspect um, the cache hit that you get at the machine level. So if you run something like this, uh, these are how you're going to get the results so for, for, per each VM. You get the cache hit ratio uh, that happened as part of this query. And what you can do with this, you can expose it as a metric. So if you have a scenario where your query performance is degraded, so it's degraded, then you can easily uh, understand whether this has something to do with uh, caching or cache misses, uh, which is uh, what we do, by the way. Let's talk about query. Uh, so just a couple of suggestions there. Uh, make sure you set a proper stainless limit. Uh, this will avoid blocking your query to compute the table state uh, or the latest table snapshot. So if you set it properly, it's still, it, it has no effect on data recency. You're still going to have the latest data on the table. It just means that all of those computations of the table, set, table state are going to happen asynchronously. Uh, and the next thing, you want to avoid state reconstruction du during reads, so set it to something which is bigger than uh, your over overall commit files. And if you see that uh, you have an, a problem, or this is how you're probably going to see if you have a problem with, with metadata handling, you're going to see uh, this job, data skipping reader v2, that takes too much time when you read, so you have to look into your metadata. Uh, this is... Um, comparison that we did. So like I said, we started over a year ago. It was, uh, I think, DBR 8.3. We were working closely with uh, Databricks and, and Azure team uh, to, to meet the SLA that we wanted. So you can see that on 8.3, it was pretty much okay until the 90 percentile. Uh, but then it does, just does not meet the SLA of 10 seconds. <clears throat> and after all those improvements, this is, by the way, I think mainly comes from um, caching and, and having a better cache hit rate, and also uh, some extra bandwidth that we got, um, we were able to meet the SLA of uh, 99 percentile uh, for our customers, which is uh, around six seconds. Okay, so um, it was a long journey. Uh, I'll quickly go some of the improvements that we got from the team. So we got many, many fixes to eliminate some inefficiencies in, in the delta log and metadata handling, which eventually uh, led to the idea of incremental commits and also incremental tech checkpoints that will come later this year. On the delta cache, we got improved cache affinity and hit rate. Uh, we started, I think, with something like 60 or 65% for cache hit rate, and now we're easily in the high 90s. And there's also support for multiple cache replicas, so you can, uh, using this syntax, you can um, choose to replicate or have more than uh, one replica for your uh, cache data. Vacuum, so we had uh, some issues there. Again, we have a lot of files and a lot of data, so we got uh, 47x speed up, uh, which got into uh, DBR 1041. 
and also some support to uh, reduce throttling and, and uh, avoid uh, throttling as much as possible. Okay. So where we are today, pretty much good with ingestion. By the way, we are rolling out, I think, I, today or tomorrow with the first set of customers to production. Uh, we're good with ingestion, and it's yeah, even gonna get better with uh, incremental commits. We're good with compaction, because once we realize we don't really need the order, so our compaction jobs are running smoothly. On the caching side, um, we used, uh, like I said, a managed cache which proved to be very useful and our cache hit rate is over uh, 60%, over 90%, over 90 sorry. Query, which is, is great for 85% of our, our customers um, and there's still some work to be done uh, when uh, someone wants to query the entire Delta Lake of 30 days uh, for a very, very large customer. This still does not meet the SLA, so that's kind of where we are in this uh, progress, and this is what we um, pretty much have left. Um, so that's it. I want to thank you for listening, and I'll be now taking questions. Thank you. You're, you're doing mainly in the, like append-only operations, so that's what I assume. So what does Lakehouse provide you compared to the traditional parquet file when you use like timestamp as a file name? Yeah, great question about the lake house. So we, we chose to, to use the lake house because for this type of use case, we're only providing interactive analytics, right? Uh, but the idea was to um, use the same data to uh, be used for uh, reports. I didn't show other workloads that are running over the same set of data, but we do have some other workloads. So uh, think of uh, reports, pre-sale, uh, some marketing jobs that are happening, definitely a lot of research, and soon uh, hopefully some ML workloads are going to happen once this uh, goes entirely into production. So we wanted to have just one data set that has everything and provides everything, uh, interactive analytics, reporting, BI, uh, machine learning, and, and, and all of those. Hey, the um, question I have is, uh, do you have any requirements that where you have millisecond SLAs? Not really. Um, so we do have 10 seconds of for the 99 percentile, but I think the average is around three or four seconds of what we have for most of our customers. So that's, that's pretty decent, and this is kind of what we get. And if, how are you serving any requirements where APIs need to consume this data? Like Sorry? We, if, if there are APIs which need to consume data from your data, do you move this to another storage engine which can support the millisecond responses? No, we use this, this data set to, okay. uh, like I said, to provide analytics uh, within. With the same know, storage. Yeah, yeah, same storage. Okay. Hey, great talk. Uh, Thank you. Quick question. Uh, with this setup, did you set up a DR site? How did you accomplish your disaster recovery in case one of your uh, availability zones goes down? I missed the second part. Can you repeat? Uh, did, uh, the question was more on uh, DR sites. Did you set up a disaster recovery site? on if your AZ goes down, yeah. how is this data available? How are your pipelines being yeah. you know, working on a DR side? Yeah, that's a, that's a long answer. Uh, why won't we uh, meet offline and then I can uh, talk to you about how we do it because it's gonna take me at least 10 minutes to understand, to explain what we do there. Sorry about that. Um, you, you mentioned object store throttling was an issue. Yeah. Um, I'm curious how, how you address that. Or yeah, so, yeah, thank you. So, you know, the, like I said, the number one thing that helps with that is just prefetching. Uh, bring data and just avoid going to the storage if you don't have to. Uh, the second thing is that we were able to get uh, a feature called original storage uh, from Microsoft Azure, which has exceedingly high uh, bandwidth rate. So uh, using that, we pick around 500 gigabits a second for ingress. And on egress, uh, reading the data, we sometimes pick around one terabits a second using this regional storage that we have on Azure. So those two things uh, really helped. Uh, sorry, quick two questions. So yep. the ingestion, is it a batch ingestion or the streaming ingestion in this? Streaming. Case? Streaming. Yep. And when you, 
when you save the data, is it the delta table on the Databricks or the Azure storage? So the actual storage is on Azure. So it's a delta table where the parquet files and the metadata actually sits on an Azure, Azure storage account, ADLS. So there's, there's no saving on the Databricks in itself as delta tables? No. Okay, no. okay cool. So thanks for that. Hey, great talk. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, incremental checkpoints. Yeah. So are you planning to aggregate state? Okay, so to be honest, I don't know much about incremental checkpoints. I know it's uh, pretty cutting edge stuff that's going to come later this year. Uh, the only thing I can tell you about it, it should speed up the way it takes to, make, to take a checkpoint, to make a checkpoint. Uh, I can talk a little bit about incremental commits, but incremental checkpoints is kind of still in the works, so I, I don't have all the details. But I, I'm sure some folks will, from Databricks uh, can help with that. All right, thanks. Hey, Shannon. Hi, hey, guy. Hey. Quick question. I know you mentioned the 99th percentile a couple of times. Just for context, can you can you elaborate on what a 99th percentile is in, in the amount of data oh, yeah. per day or per hour? So what, what, is, what is that size customer? What a 99% is? Yeah, what, 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 mm -hmm. how much data is that for that customer that, that belongs into that 99%? How much data it is? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it really changes. So before that, you know, 99%, that is a number where, you know, 99% of the numbers are either, you know, are lower or equal to that. Uh, and the average is way, way less uh, for uh, how much data that is. Uh, so, so for some of our largest customers, uh, you know, the, the big ones that I mentioned, this can easily uh, get around 400 or 450 terabytes of data uh, and still being read within, you know, less than 10 seconds. Thanks, a guy. Excellent job, by the way. Thank you. Hey, uh, could you talk a little bit more about the maintenance that you run on your delta tables, so around like uh, vacuuming optimizations, and yep. so on. So we run optimize uh, just on an hourly basis um, without the order. So we have a scheduled job that runs every hour and optimizes the data. And for vacuum, uh, what we do is that the, the important thing with vacuum is you want to try to delete, a, you know, a full partition whenever you're deleting stuff. Uh, so you want to try to avoid uh, doing things that are going to delete a part of, of a file uh, because that's going to end up with rewriting the data and makes your vacuum job uh, run way slower. So try to uh, run your vacuum in the same schedule as your partition. So let's say you have an hourly partition or like we have a daily partition, just run once a day, delete the entire partition, let it run, even if it takes, I don't know, 15 hours, run slowly. Uh, make sure you don't get any throttling uh, because it does uh, make requests to the object store. Uh, but try to relate full partitions. Um, and yep, that's the um, uh, maintenance that we have. So do you just have a cluster that's constantly running your optimized jobs? Mm, it, now, it's not constantly running. I think it takes something like 20 to 25 minutes to optimize an hourly set of data. So it does go down. Hey, Jose. Hello. Um, so a question is, if you had the opportunity to re, probably talk to yourself a year ago, what are, what are the learnings, um, not just from technology, but also from a people process that yeah. you had, and what, what would you do differently? Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest learning is that if you want to do something like this and you have a, you know, a complicated workload, that, such as what we have, uh, it's definitely better to go and partner with someone. Uh, so we chose Azure and Databricks, so we chose Azure Databricks uh, to do this. Uh, and you know, I think if you wanna, uh, you wanna go far, you better go together. I think that's the, the main thing because we were working closely with both Microsoft and Databricks in order to deliver this. It was not, you know, it was not a, an easy ride. Uh, it took us a while to get there, uh, but I don't think we would be able to deliver it without the help of those uh, two companies. 
So that's, I think, the, the main takeaway that I'll, I'll say. I saw you mentioned um, you're using Harley Optimize. Um, any reason you didn't go for Auto Optimize? Sorry, can you repeat? Any reason you didn't go for Auto Optimize? Auto Optimize? We tried it. Uh, it added some latency that we could not allow. Uh, so it's a great feature if you don't have, I think, very strict KPIs on, on your ingestion. It's going to add, uh, it's going to create even bigger files. But for us, just optimized writes was, was enough. Hi, I have a question about the Delta cache. So in yep. our organization, we have scheduled jobs at 6 a.m. that uh, load a lot of tables okay. into Delta cache. Yep. Uh, it improved the query performance greatly, but uh, we have uh, BI platforms like um, Power BI that uh, use direct query against the Delta cache table. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I look at the performance, a lot of it is due to the network. The data still needs to be transferred from the cache to the Power BI platform. So do you think like this is the best we could do right now, or do you think you know, we could even bring the data and cache it on the BI platforms? Um, yeah, I have to, have to think. Um, if you want to connect after, so uh, we can talk a little bit more about your use case uh, and ex understand exactly what you're doing with those uh, BI tools. Perfect, yeah, I think that, that's all the questions, right? Unless anyone's got any additional questions? Well, good, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh,